Okay, good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome to this first Network Ed Technology and Education Seminar. The Network Ed Seminars are a new series that CLT are launching and what we want to do is to bring together a whole range of speakers from education, computing, media and all sorts of related fields to start looking at some of the questions that are shaping education today. We want to raise questions, encourage debate both within and without the school and look at a whole series of transforming issues which really are changing the way we teach and learn. The seminar series is possible through the generous sponsorship of the annual fund, so I'd first of all like to, to thank them for making it happen, and uh, I think we'll learn a lot from doing it. So thank you very much indeed, annual fund. Before I move on to introduce our first speakers, I'd like to also very briefly say something about uh, the technology. Along with the spirit of the event, we really are making efforts to try and make it available outside the LSE and try and break down some of the constraints and barriers. So what we're doing is going to explore or experiment or play with a whole series of relatively lightweight and simple technologies that will enable others to join in with us and to, to share the experience. So, gosh, a camera is working behind us. So as you can see, what we have here is a very simple web page with a streaming video stream currently showing me and underneath a whole series of tweets and if you want to join in and, and tweet during a presentation the hashtag is up on the wall. Equally there are friends and colleagues from around London who are joining us online and maybe from outside London as well, who knows. So this event really is starting to stretch out and, and break down some of the barriers we'll be talking about. In future presentations, we hope to explore other and different technologies. Okay, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our first two speakers. And I'm going to introduce Jane Secker and Emma Coonan, who are going to talk about... Jane, I've forgotten the title of your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to remind me. A new curriculum for information literacy. A new curriculum, thank you, for <coughs> information literacy. Emma is Research Skills and Development Librarian at Cambridge, and she's responsible for designing and teaching classes on various facets of information finding, handling and management. Jane from the Centre for Learning Technology will be known to many of you, and recently Jane and Emma have been working together as Arcadia Fellows at Wolfson College, Cambridge, and it's from there that this work has come. We're also joined today by Helen Webster, sitting here, and Helen is the latest Arcadia Fellow, I believe, who will be continuing with the work they've been doing. So, without further ado, I'd now like to hand over to Emma and Jane. Thank you, Steve. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for the chance to come and talk to you today. You have a plethora of Arcadia Fellows, if that's the correct collective noun. Um, we want to tell you quite briefly about the research that we did. To start with some background, Jane and I were Arcadia Fellows at Wolfson College, Cambridge in um, the Easter term, so from May until July this year. The Arcadia programme is funded by an anonymous donor to Cambridge University Library and the programme as a whole is intended to explore the role of libraries in a digital age and particularly how they can be more accessible, useful, supportive to the undergraduate student. The academic advisor to the project is Professor John Norton, who has also a plethora of roles. He is a columnist for The Guardian, he is a fellow of Wolfson College, and perhaps most interestingly for our project, he is Professor of the Public Understanding of Technology at The Open University, which is possibly the best title in the world. Yeah. There have been 20 or so Arcadia Fellows already. It's been running for the last three years. It, the project or the programme as a whole is unfortunately about to come to an end this Christmas. And Helen is one of the last fellows who are working on the project at the moment. Each of us has done very small bite-sized things around the idea of what a library can do for undergraduates. And they all map onto this diagram somewhere. So it could be things to do with the changing media ecosystem, it could be to do with academic publishing, it could be to do with changes in the higher education environment. It's a very flexible, loose, exciting remit. The only thing that's a bit challenging <coughs> is that each project lasts for 10 weeks. And this was our remit. 
that we had to do in 10 weeks, design and develop a new and revolutionary curriculum <coughs> for information literacy in a digital age. So no pressure there. <coughs> we had to work pretty quickly. So we decided early on that we had specific aims that we needed to fulfill. First of all, we needed to know what we were talking about and to try and get away as far as possible from any assumptions that we might be making that have to do with our library background or the way we work, the way we research, and actually look at the needs of undergraduates who are coming into higher education over the next five years. To do this, we decided we should try to map the current landscape of information literacy, which is what I'm going to be talking to you about chiefly in my section. And of course, we had to develop a practical curriculum and some resources to support it. It was very important to us that the curriculum should be practical, should be something that any of you in higher education could take and use and work with in a way that suited you and suited your students. And Jane will talk to you more about that in a little while. Brief overview of our method. We decided to use a combined methodology. We wanted to go with a Delphi study which is a way of asking experts in a number of fields to predict what they think future trends will be. We had a modified Delphi study because actually in a real Delphi study your experts are not allowed to talk to one another at all. They're not allowed to meet. They're not allowed to put them in the same room. We decided we really wanted to put them in the same room so that they could talk and exchange views and we could benefit by listening to their dialogue. So we asked them for their views in a series of interviews and later on we brought them together and put them in the same room for an expert workshop. At this workshop, we presented the first pass at the curriculum, which was refined in the light of the findings that came out of the workshop. We also presented the theoretical overview of the field, which we'd undertaken, and a number of the findings from the interviews, which is going to form the bulk of what we talk about for the first part of the session. We started, as you start any research, we started it as a journey. And doing research about the nature of research is a particularly interesting journey because it's a kind of meta pass over the whole thing. You're not just doing it, you're looking at yourself do it as well, which can be quite a disconcerting thing. As you'll see, this morphed into a lot of learning, and the learning was about the process of learning, so we continue the meta theme. One of the most significant things that we had to ask from the outset was what actually does information literacy mean? And we uncovered something that really is quite interesting and which informed our research ongoingly. There's a significant problem with conflicting terminology around the things that are important to us in this field. Conversely, there's a significant issue around conflicting definitions of information literacy. So of those in the room, how many librarians or library staff are present? I'll give me a wave. Do you tend to use the term information literacy? Do you use it? within your own profession solely, or do you ever use it as a way of communicating with other stakeholders, students, faculty? It depends. Yeah. 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 And it takes a bit of explanation sometimes, doesn't it? It's, um, it's become a library identified piece of jargon. And I think we've, to an extent, we've lost control of the agenda of what other people understand by it. We know what we mean by it, but what other people hear may not be in line with what we are trying to say. So it's pretty well documented in the library world, actually. We know what we think information literacy is. The SILIP definition is knowing when and why you need information and where to find it, how to evaluate, use, and communicate it in an ethical manner. What Jane and I discovered in our learning about learning process was that our approach to do with information literacy actually had quite a lot more to do with the learning process itself, not just how information is discovered or accessed, how it's managed, how it's analysed, how it's assimilated, what kind of emotional impact it has on the learner. When we started, Sconnell's Seven Pillars model had just been reissued and revised, and it now has a higher education research lens, which contributed quite a lot to our understanding of where we were going around information literacy. But of course there are these other literacies now. There are non-textual, non-hard copy literacies, particularly around digital technologies. So media literacy and digital fluency in particular are concepts that have come to the fore in recent years. They're concepts that from a narrower definition of information literacy seem to challenge or to pose a parallel set of literacies to what we might think of as IL. And yet, if you look at the recent Demos report, it is very, very big on 
digital fluency, but it says digital fluency is defined as the ability to find and critically evaluate information online. And to do that, you need a combination of old and new technological abilities. This is not just about suddenly going into the online world. It's not about an alien world. It's about bringing your abilities with you and building on what you've got. So this element of critical evaluation became very, very significant for us with all that it implies for learning. And actually, this is really what's at the heart of the new curriculum. I've picked out three of what I thought are the most interesting issues that we encountered in our research. So these are my personal favorites. These are all bearing on how information literacy and learning are perceived in higher education and what this means for the learner. So we became very interested in the transition to university and the transition to independent learning, which is not at all the same thing. We also looked in quite a lot of detail at the idea of academic mainstream thinking and practice and the kind of support realm that sits around it and how those are perceived. And we looked at the library and its role in information literacy as a form of cloistered garden and as against the labyrinth of research and the open web. And I will come back to the Demos report, Truth Lies in the Internet, a little later. But let me just give you a heads up that basically they say everything we did, which is rather nice to have confirmation. So transition. Students entering higher education are very frequently confronted with a radical change in learning culture. And they're confronted with one which is not explicitly explained, not always well supported. Many have experienced school learning as a kind of teach to test culture. So they experience discrete chunks of information communicated through instruction, knowledge transfer. What's in my head is going to go into yours and we'll ask you about it later. It's tested by means of memorization and repetition. So what is rewarded can end up being the rote answer, not understood, but memorized, and also the right answer. So the concept of the right answer is one that is quite significant within this culture. Suddenly the goalposts change. Suddenly, what is rewarded is an interpretative view, a questioning view, a view where you are synthesizing other viewpoints and bringing them together. Value is placed on qualities like finding your voice, on critical analysis. What actually are these things? When your supervisor gives you feedback, it says, be more critical. How do you go about doing that? Here is one of the first issues that really arises around concepts of information literacy and how it's perceived in higher education. For us, these issues around transition and between different kinds of learning and the transition towards being an independent learner is incredibly salient, incredibly significant to the mainstream academic mission. But within our interviews, within our research, we very often found that the solution to this problem, if you like, of a student not understanding criticality is to direct the student to a support service which will fix the problem. Okay? So you end up with study skills advice, you end up with library advice, you can end up, if you're lucky, with learning development advice, or if it goes really wrong, you can end up in counselling. But in every single aspect of this, the problem as is being, the student is being pathologized. It is the student who needs to make up ground. Not that this part of learning is actually significantly part of the whole experience of being in higher education, part of the whole experience of emerging as an independent learner. The two are made separate. So what could be a reflective experience, the transition to a new learning culture, is suddenly made remedial. Second thing of interest, when you have this conceptual divide between the business of mainstream academia <clears throat> and the support environment around it, so that you have a centralized academic mission and then you have things around it that support but are not of it, what does this do for the support environment generally for information literacy? There can be an enormous confusion between information literacy and ICT abilities. Quite often, if you ask somebody, what do you think information literacy is? They will say, isn't it the ability to use a computer and to you know, go online and find stuff? And you think, well, yes, that's part of. Most assuredly, you're going along the right lines. But to identify the two, to conflate them like that, is to be very reductivist about what information literacy is and can do. But this confusion is quite often bolstered when you have institutions with converged library and computing services, yeah? and where information literacy is placed squarely in that arena. 
what can happen is that it becomes a matter of mastering tools and interfaces of learning skills for dealing with finding information on the internet. So what could be a learning experience if it were placed within a subject environment is again externalized and made to seem as though this is a skill set, a set of masteries about tools. So it's not about transferable strategies. It's not about learning development. It is not iterative or evolving. Once again, the focus tends to be on here is a chunk of learning. Here is how to do X on the internet. Now you can do it anywhere. It's not transferable. It's just repeated. Okay. I think it's important to stress that for us, digital literacy, digital fluency is, as I say, a component within information literacy. And this is something which we've been influenced by the ACRL, which is the Association of College and Research Libraries in the US. Way back in 2000, the ACRL suggested that information literacy abilities use technologies, but they're ultimately independent of them. So one is a component of the other. It happens very often as well that information literacy is linked with transferable skills for graduate employment. Yeah? So that pushes the IL agenda towards the other end, if you like, of the student experience. It can be linked with the support services, again, like disability, like counselling, like learning development. Where this happens, it can seem like an easy win for information literacy because support services necessarily and deservedly have visibility, possibly not the visibility that they deserve, but they have visibility within the higher education environment. Putting IL with them means that IL, information literacy, becomes more visible. And yet, this runs the risk of producing a generic, extraneous focus so that the whole lot is seen as being separate from and supplementary to the academic mission once again. I had a lot of fun writing about information literacy in the library and about librarians' perceptions of information, academic perceptions of information. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of very, very useful, knowledgeable articles and books out there which are a really good read. And thanks to this project, I actually had the time to sit down and read and enjoy them all, which was amazing. What I came out with is an idea that you can actually, again, draw a conceptual contrast between the academic perception of information and the library perception of information. So I'm going to make broad sweeping generalizations here, be warned. But one can be said, if you conceive of knowledge within the higher education academic viewpoint, it tends to be conceived of as an intellectual operation. So it tends to focus and prioritize the individual insight, the individual contribution to knowledge, something that is unique. Yeah? From a library point of view, it's much more systematic. So we tend to focus on scholarly knowledge as a corpus of data which needs to be stored, which needs to be indexed, ordered, retrieved, filtered. And this is how we make it manageable, retrievable, meaningful. What we do when we produce a system that contains this information or a taxonomy that contains scholarly information is therefore very slightly subtly, in a very nuanced way, at odds with what scholars might be conceiving of, because they are trying to get away from a knowledge structure while we are trying to impose it. And what can happen is that the knowledge structures that we create, which are supposed to guide people through large corpora of information, are actually so confusing that we have to still be on hand to guide them through. So my favorite example, you don't get to look up Millennium Bug in the Library of Congress subject headings. You get to look up year 2000 date conversion issues. So. Are you going to tell me you don't need a librarian to find that out? I don't think so. What comes of this is that the library can end up as a very bounded space. It is a very secure space. In a digital era particularly, it becomes a kind of cloistered garden. We have resources which have been selected for you by experts. We have resources which are catalogued and made available to you in a systematic way, again, by experts. And the debate has tended to polarize around reliability, trust, academic authority, so that the library provided resources are now set at odds with the open web. And this is again a reductivist way of looking at things. Okay? Information comprises the whole world of information, not just the open web, kind of ooh, dodgy, very bad, and library stuff, always reliable, always good. <clears throat> when you put this polarization together with the focus on system, 
which again emphasizes ability to use interfaces, ability to use tools and products. It results in this mistaken identification of information literacy as the ability to use library tools, or it can do. Moira Bent did an excellent study in 2008 as the result of her National Teaching Fellowship and she spoke to a librarian who said, students, they don't know how to use that database properly so they can't be information literate. Okay, so immediate conflation of ability to use databases as being information literate. We reckon it's a bit bigger than that. Library models, library theories of instruction tend to place a major emphasis on searching. So they remain aloof very often from kind of higher order intellectual operations that you do alongside searching. Synthesis, evaluation, how does this fit in with my argument? All they tend to do is tell you about searching. The researcher doesn't make any difference between those actions. Yeah? What the researcher does is try to complete a task in a given environment, in a given context, to the best of his or her ability. And that means he or she needs to be equipped with the necessary competences and attitudes and discipline-specific abilities in order to perform what is actually an iterative exploratory activity. That is search meeting research. It's something that you go on doing. It's something that both informs and is informed by where the learner is at any stage of his or her development. If you break down that dynamic ongoing evolution into, well, this is what you do about searching, and then this is everything else over here, then you've interrupted a process which is ongoing, which is circular, which is dynamic, and you've kind of fixed and frozen the search part of it. And again, you've said, this is different from the rest of the academic mission. Searching is something we know about, and it's separate. Not as far as researchers are concerned. So once again, information literacy can end up being presented as a kind of bolt-on skill set, or supplementary skill set, that is separate from actual research critical evaluation. But we think it's not just about searching. We think it is a lot more integrated than that. I mentioned earlier the 2011 Demos report, Truth Lies in the Internet. Um, the Demos report argues that helping young people to navigate the incredibly variable information sources out there on the internet should be achieved not by trying to control, but by trying to assist young people to develop the skills that mean that they can evaluate for themselves what's out there, which really echoes where we're coming from very, very much. So the move towards independent learning has to be modelled in the way we actually think and the language that we use about these activities. So the report suggests let's talk less about the internet causing harm. Let's talk more about what young people are bringing to the interaction with the internet. And let's talk more about how we can facilitate equipping them with effectively an information literate point of view that allows them to evaluate information in whatever format, digitally, in hard copy, in any platform. The Demos report also touches on a general human issue around information, which I find fascinating. It's emotional impact, and it has its very close link with our own identity, our own personas. So it suggests we tend to search for evidence that supports our belief, rather than evidence that might refute our beliefs. It suggests that we notice more flaws in studies that we disagree with than studies we agree with. And this is the rationale behind strand 10 of our curriculum, which reaches beyond the higher education arena and into what all of us do on an everyday basis around information, how we decide what to trust, how we decide what to act on. So it is a social dimension of information literacy. In all, what we decided needed to happen as a result of our research was an, in, a rehabilitation of the term information literacy so that we could all perhaps step back and look at what we think it is and then look at what we might use it for and how we might apply it in a broader context. So to put our research on the line, we think that information literacy is not currently seen as part of the mainstream academic mission, despite the fact that we are convinced it is an integral part of the learning development of every individual. We're also convinced that it's not just a functional skill set, it is actually a continuum that begins with functional skills, those are very necessary, but which then goes through subject-specific competencies, through higher order critical thinking skills, right up to very, very high level intellectual operations, such as synthesis, such as creation of new knowledge. It goes all the way up. And perhaps most controversially, we think that information literacy should be a whole university endeavor. 
So it is not merely the preserve of the library and it should not be seen as the saviour of the library in a digital age either. And we think that information literacy is fundamental to the development of the individual, social as well as academic. In fact, the definition that we like the most is the definition issued by UNESCO, which is that information literacy empowers people in all walks of life to seek, evaluate, use and create information effectively to achieve their personal, social, occupational and educational goals. It is a basic human right in a digital world and promotes social inclusion in all nations. I told you that no pressure about this research in 10 weeks. I'm going to hand over to Jane, who is going to tell you more about the expert consultation side of our research. OK, <laughs> okay thanks, Emma. Um, I'm going to talk to you um, a bit about um, the, um, the findings uh, from our experts and then obviously give you an overview of the, the curriculum that we developed and also I know some of you have got handouts that I put on the chairs and the resources are all available afterwards on our website. Um, in our expert consultation um, what we were looking to do was um, speak to um, the people that we considered to be experts in information literacy. Um, so um, no apologies really that quite a large number of the people we did speak to were librarians. We did also speak to researchers in the field, to, um, to educators, we spoke to some trainee teachers. Um, and school librarians um, and they gave us a fascinating um, insight into um, what they thought should be in this curriculum. But actually um, one of the things that, that came as a bit of a surprise to us um, was that, that what they told us was um, that, that it wasn't, um, what went into the curriculum was obviously very, very important, but it was also about how you taught this curriculum, how it was delivered, um, and that, that was actually at least as important as what went into it and what, what the kind of um, aspects of information literacy were covered. Um, they, <clears throat> they were also very clear um, that um, whatever we developed, it had to be possible for this to be embedded into an academic curriculum because the disciplines will vary so much. Um, even at LSE where we're you know, broadly all social sciences, the, the, the differences between an anthropologist, um, between an economist you know, are vast. If, if, you, if you go to a, a university like Cambridge where you have medical students, English students, um, what, what goes in one discipline is, is not going to be the same um, in another discipline. Um, and also, um, they, they felt that um, what we really needed to do as well was, was to let students bring something to this as well. They don't all come to us, um, e even if they have all gone through um, A-levels, um, they don't all come to us at the same sort of level, so their, their needs and their their kind of abilities will vary and I, I think that's something that we all see who deal with undergraduate students. Um, so we have to be able to adapt the curriculum to take into account those differences but also we have to allow students to be able to reflect on what they know already perhaps and areas where they need to brush up um, their skills. So what did our experts say in terms of um, the format and the structure of the curriculum? Um, Emma's uh, sort of um, intimated some of this. Um, the idea that the curriculum was holistic, that it wasn't something that stood outside of the academic curriculum, that it was fully embedded into the curriculum, was really key and something that all our experts um, told us was, was going to be really critical to the success of what we were trying to develop. Also, um, something that was perhaps um, modular, so that, that people could kind of plug in different bits as appropriate, either to the discipline or to the level of their students. Um, people talked to us as well about the way the curriculum was delivered. In terms of the, the mode, so whether it was online or face-to-face, -face, and again, flexibility was really important here. So having a fixed curriculum where we said there will be 10 classes and you know they all have to be on a Tuesday morning at, uh, at 11 o'clock wasn't going to work. We have to be able to adapt the timings, but also the mode. So, so in some institutions, it may just not be possible to get 
you know, 800 students together in a, in a, in a computer room to, to, to do hands-on activities. You may have to use online. So whatever we develop, developed needed to be um, adaptable to different institutions. But what I think was really key was, um, and, and I think this is something that's really in the heart of information literacy, that it's got to be, um, it's got to be an active process. So I think none of us think that the ideal scenario is to go in and give students a lecture on the importance of citing and referencing. It, it's really, you know, better that they actually do something hands-on. But I think active learning was, was something that came across from our experts as being really important to, to getting the students to, to really um, to understand these issues and opportunities um, not just to do um, computer-based activities but actually to discuss things amongst themselves and, and have um, time to, to reflect, as, as I mentioned before, kind of what, what they already know and, and perhaps how when they get to higher education what, what's changed and what's different from what they might have done at school. And this is very much um, something that um, I think in the in the library profession um, we're grappling with at the moment that it's a, a shift from from um, training sessions that people are perhaps getting quite happy and comfortable with delivering to actually it being um, more like a teaching session. So running a session where where actually you don't just stand at the front and deliver that that the students interact that they discuss and perhaps they go off at all sorts of you know. Um, in different directions that you hadn't anticipated and that can be a bit scary for some people but I think that that's really important. They also talked to us about when, um, when in the curriculum, when in the year um, that the, the, um, these sort of different uh, slots could be um, included and it being very important that it was tied into real activities that students had to do. Um, there is always a bit of a tendency to want to tell them everything at the start of the year in some sort of induction. Obviously that's not always the best time to teach somebody um, certain skills and who teaches it as well and I think Helen's going to talk a bit more about um, that aspect. Um, our experts told us that assessment was very important. Assessment um, is is something that's always quite difficult, I think, with um, particularly when information literacy hasn't been a core part of a, an academic programme, perhaps when it's an optional session that students choose to come to. Um, it can be quite difficult to come up with um, a meaningful assessment, but, but really students are going to be very strategic learners like we all are. So if everything is just optional activities, then you know, how, how are you going to actually measure and, and, and see any sort of improvement if you don't build assessment into this? And so that's something we've put into our curriculum as well, is some suggested assessments. Um, by marketing, what, what a lot of our experts talked to us about um, was how you got buy-in to the curriculum. So it, it's all very well, get a group of librarians in a room together, they all think this is a great idea. Even bring in some people from a teaching and learning centre, from um, you know, other support services, we all think this is a good idea, but how do we get wider buy-in? How do we get um, our departments to, to sort of realise that information literacy um, is, is a you know is a sort of fundamental part of, of learning so there's in our report there's quite a lot of suggestions I think language is very important but it's also it's it's really key to make sure that you're you're looking at what the sort of hooks are whether it's the employability agenda whether it is that actually students are, are struggling if you're getting instances of plagiarism that can be another area to sort of to show that the curriculum can help with in all of this, um, one of the sort of fundamental things we really believed, and, and this comes from um, the writings of, uh, of Biggs in the sort of education field, um, which is, is basically the idea of aligning the curriculum to the discipline, knowledge, the skills and the behaviour that you want your students to have at the end. And that's something that was really um, important and struck Emma and I, and something we tried to do when we structured our curriculum. Um, technology. Now, um, I, I think Emma, Emma and I were sort of um, were a little torn here of how technology might fit into our curriculum. Um, we're, we're talking to the Network Dead um, in the, in this series, and I think we couldn't 
go, we couldn't sort of not say something about technology. But one of the things we felt was really key, and, and a lot of our experts um, really emphasised this point, was that um, the curriculum would have to include some specific tools and software, but this would be a way that really it would, it would it, it could basically date the curriculum. So what we wouldn't want to do is be very prescriptive and sort of list out certain tools, you know, that, that, that students would need to know. I think what we tried to do is be technology neutral, but focus much more on um, what the sort of the underlying skills are that those technologies um, are good for. So something like uh, Google Reader, uh, RSS, and the ability to get um, updates. It, it's kind of, what's that about? That's about a way of keeping yourself updated. It's not about just learning the functionality behind the Google Reader tool. Um, the experts did talk quite a bit, though, about assumptions in the future that you might be able to make about students. So we talked quite a bit about um, ownership um, of, of laptops, of um, computer technology, of mobile technology, and how you know we've, we've seen um, this grow so massively. And it's likely over the next five years to be something um, that will grow. Whether there'll ever be a point that you can assume that all students will come with, with a laptop, you know, it is still quite, it's, it's difficult. I think um, the demand for, for sort of fixed PCs in the, in the library at LSE is still relatively high. So I, th I think this is an area where it hasn't changed, hasn't happened quite as quickly as we might think. Um, the Google generation um, and the sort of debate around whether uh, young people are digital natives wired in a different way was something that our experts mentioned as well. Um, most of them were kind of discounting this theory and again the idea that we have to um, we, we can't make assumptions and we can't say that all all 18-year-olds uh, will know how to do this or they will be happy using social media. Um, I think that's really clear and there is quite a lot of research that suggests the group is, is a lot less homogenous than you might think. But I think we will see growing trends with things like cloud computing, greater use of, of social media and things like that. Um, so. The attributes of our curriculum, and a lot of these I've talked about um, just through what the experts were telling us, is the holistic idea, and Emma mentioned this as well, about something that can support the whole research process. The, the idea that it would be modular, very important to be embedded within the context of an academic discipline, flexible, and active learning and assessed. So, I'll, I'll show you now in terms of um, the 10 strands that we've developed. And as I say, most of you should have on your chair um, the sort of full curriculum document that we developed. Um, the strands reflect the areas that were identified by the expert panellists, um, but they also arose out of our own sort of reading of the literature as well. Um, and they're not supposed to be linear, so although they're numbered 1 to 10, um, and it might appear, because certainly number 1 is starting um, with the transition from school to higher education, and 10 is the social dimension of information literacy in some ways links to um, the, the student leaving higher education, going out into what the workplace. We more um, see this curriculum as, as a, a circle or a spiral. Um, but each of the different strands, um, we've, we've developed um, sort of learning outcomes, um, activities or, or sample activities and assessments associated with them. I'm going to unpack them a little bit different in, in, a, in a moment, I think. What they do also have um, is each of those strands has uh, five broad um, learning categories. So what we sort of see is that um, at a, a sort of basic level, you've got the kind of functional skills that Emma talked about. That might be about learning to operate certain systems. But each of the strands goes up through a sort of a set of levels to higher level intellectual operations. The, um, if, if you were developing um, a set of classes around this, we wouldn't 
we wouldn't assume you'd have 10 classes. We would think that you can take these strands and use those flexibly. Um, you can take different aspects of the strands um, and put them into the same class where it's appropriate at the same sort of level. Um, but in designing any class, what we would hope you'd do is have active, reflective um, activities um, in there that would be relevant to your students' needs. So different ways that it's been suggested you could use the curriculum um, is one thing that um, we could do, and we talked about whether to do this at LSE, is audit across an institution to see, well, which, who, is, who is covering these in any large undergraduate course to make sure that students are getting this. Um, but you could obviously audit your own co uh, classes, you could audit um, across a department as well. They're all suggestions of how you use the curriculum. Um, I've got an slightly nicer uh, visual representation of the curriculum that um, probably explains the, f the different levels that I was talking about um, in, a, in a clearer way. And we've got each of our strands here. This again um, is showing that it's a, a much more sort of circular, it, it's not supposed to be a linear model. Um, yeah. <laughs> what I was going to just do really briefly is just tell, focus on two particular strands and um, just tell you a little bit more um, about those. Um, I say this, the full document is, on, is available for you to have a look at. The first strand, the transition from school to higher education, um, is divided so we've got kind of three areas that this covers. Um, what are the expectations at higher education level in your discipline? Um, it also looks at the conventions in, in again in your discipline. So this is this is allowing it to be adapted around reading, writing, and presenting. Um, and then it's also an opportunity to get students to reflect on perhaps what they were doing at school um, or before they came into higher education and what might have changed when they get to higher education, what the expectations are. And I think th this reflection sort of element is really key because I think certainly one of the um, things that when we spoke to, um, partic particularly um, some s people working in schools, they said that a lot of students will struggle with the fact that they may well have been incredibly successful when they've been at school. They've gone through the A-level system, if they've come to LSE, if they've come to Cambridge, they've got very, very high grades. So they think they're doing something right. They think that the way that they've been learning, the, possibly with this kind of teach to test, has, is, is working. And so they get a little bit of a shock if they come um, to a, a, a prestigious institution and their first piece of work, they get told, you're doing this all wrong, you know, or... Um, you know, well, well, no, of course there isn't a book that's got the answer in. That's not how we do it, you know. So, so there's, there's a lot of work, I think, that could be done around um, uh, building activities into the curriculum that can really help with this. And we've put a couple of examples there, um, reviewing higher education level work, discuss, discussing, you know, how it might differ from perhaps an essay they wrote at school. Um, things like academic journals, which can be quite a mystery, actually, to a lot of students who have come from a school where increasingly they don't have a school library and they certainly don't have academic journals. So, you know, well, why, how, how does a, a publication, a, a a more popular publication like History Today, why is that different to the Journal of Economic History? You know, some of this may seem um, that it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's not required, but I, th I think one of the difficulties is that when you've worked in higher education for a very long time, it's quite easy to forget what you didn't know, you know, when, when you were 18, when you first arrived. So, um, and, and we've got another um, exercise where you could get students to sort of tell you, well, what are the three top sources? What would you do? You know, where would you go um, to get information? Do you go to books? Do you go to the internet? Do you go to the dreaded Wikipedia? You know, and, and think about whether that's fit for, for the purpose of, of writing an academic essay or something. Um, strand six, which I just wanted to pick up on as well, it's another one that I guess is quite familiar to people um, who deliver information literacy sessions in the library world, but it's all around managing information. But I think managing information has become such an important skill and it's way beyond just thinking about managing your references and, and citing and, uh, and sort of constructing a bibliography. You know, we're, we're talking about um, managing all the sort of information 
information that you collect. And there are all sorts of new ways that students could do this. I had quite a few at um, the uh, Freshers' Fair induction. I had quite a few students asking me about tools they could use to help them with note taking. And I've got an iPad. What should I be doing to manage all my, you know, all my notes? They weren't talking about references. Time management and planning, again, I think those are areas um, where students need a lot of help. And particularly when you talk to people in schools, having to do an extended piece of work, having several weeks to prepare an essay is not something that generally happens at school level. So time management and planning can be very hard, which is why you often do find, I think we all do it a little bit, but staying up until 3 o'clock in the morning trying to get the essay done. Um, but managing information, I think, is a, a huge complex area and it, it, it sort of ranges from the kind of note-taking time management all the way through to bibliographic reference management, but also ways of keeping you up to date, as I mentioned. So again, we've got some example activities there um, that you could do um, with students to get them to think about some of those different areas. Um, I won't go through all those um, now, but they're, 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 they're in the handout if you, if you want to know more. Um, what I should say as well is that um, we, Emma and I produced um, four fairly chunky sort of outputs from, from our research. They're all on our website, um, our new curriculum um, blog, and so they're all available to download. And we've also got somewhere where you can um, give us some feedback on there as well if you, you look at that. They're also all licensed under Creative Commons, so you're free to take our material to adapt it um, on the condition that you share it and relicense it under Creative Commons as well. But we've got um, an executive summary the curriculum which I've printed out um, some of um, the kind of meat of it for you here um, but there is a whole range of other supporting documents that go with that um, and then um, we both did separate reports so um, Emma's report on the theoretical background and then a lot more detail about the expert consultation report that I just sort of briefly outlined um, I'm going to stop and hand over I think to um, one of um, our sort of successor, I guess. We've, there's two Arcadia fellows who are working at Cambridge at the moment looking at strategies for implementing our, our curriculum. And Helen's going to talk to us, I think, a little bit about some of the work you're doing at the moment briefly. Yes, where okay. I got to. Um, Jane and Emma have done a fantastic job. Um, in some ways, they had the easy bit. Um, so myself and my project partner, Katie Rathol, um, are working on what you do with all of this in terms of the context of one particular institution and hopefully turning that into some kind of generic resource that could be helpful in implementing it elsewhere. I'm looking at the context of Cambridge. Katie's looking at some other institutions, um, including York St. John and Worcester. So hopefully our outputs will be available as well on that link. So we sat down together and coming to this afresh, we asked ourselves, so what's new about this new curriculum? Um, I'm not a librarian. I'm by background, I was a subject lecturer and I'm now a learning developer. So I'm not a librarian, so to me this was all very new. Um, and we thought, well, what's the old curriculum then? Well, we'll look at the old curriculum and we'll compare it with the new one and we'll see what the differences are. And we realised that there wasn't one. We came across the Sconal model, we came across things like the research development framework, but those are frameworks and models. And to me as a teacher, it became apparent very quickly that one of the new things about this curriculum is it's a curriculum. It's not a model, it's not a framework. So for me, looking at something like Sconal, it was useful perhaps in drawing up something like marking criteria, but it's giving you an idea of what the ideal student would be. It's a model, but it doesn't really tell me as a teacher how I would get my student to that point. Or if it's something that this is perhaps innate in the student. A good student is all of these things. It's not necessarily something you learn. So for me as a teacher, I found a document which is very interesting, but I wasn't sure what to do with it. But this, as a curriculum, gives me a way in as a teacher to try and work with my students to get them to a particular point. So the argument that your student has to have all of these attributes to be a good student starts to become quite circular, I think. And that was where I got stuck as a teacher in the sort of model or framework approach that to be a good student, you need to have all these things. And if you've got all these things, well, then you're a good student. So I think in many ways, it's not very helpful to work with that model outside of a very theoretical context. So um, 
approaches that I take with my students are very much informed by a lot of work on plagiarism. One of the main um, people that I look to for advice on teaching and plagiarism is Jude Carroll who's doing a lot of work in the context particularly of international students and she says that one of the things that you must work with when your students come to university whether they're international or wherever they're coming from it's a new game now and you play by new rules so if you and your students are both clear about that we can explain the rules, we can make it clear to the students what they need to do, they'll be fine. And that's mostly in the context of plagiarism. But I think actually this applies across the board. So, hence my metaphor here, um, we basically need to teach them what the rules of the game are. Now as a, as a teacher, the word information set my hackles up because the word for me, coming not as a librarian but from an educational background, that word is associated with very, very sort of superficial approaches to learning. Learning is about getting information and putting it into your head. And I think a lot of us still act on that principle when we teach, even though we might not um, articulate it as such. So the word information itself made me a little bit on edge um, and I've come to a new understanding of it through working with Jane and Emma. But you'll get that reaction a lot. So if you explain the rules of the game to your students, basically you're teaching them to play the system. And is that really learning? Isn't that rather superficial? Um, that basically learning is just, just playing a game? Is it just teaching to the test that you're advocating that we do? And surely if you're explaining what it is that they need to do in very clear terms, that's spoon feeding. It's making it easy. It's devaluing it. Um, I tend to look then to the game of chess. I have been taught how to play chess. Somebody very kindly sat me down as a child and explained how it works, all the rules. I'm still hopeless at it. So even though you do explain the rules of the game very clearly, I'm still rubbish at chess because in itself you might call it a game, but it's very challenging intellectually. Um, so just because you've come across similar games, I might be very good at drafts and I plonk myself down and think, well, I can do this. It's not going to work. I need someone to explain that to me. But you don't teach someone chess by just sitting at the board and letting them get on with it and telling them when they've got it wrong. So to me, explaining the, the rules of the game is not a reductive thing to do in the context that of information literacy as Jane and Emma have redefined it. So we're assessing our students often on their ability to intuit or work out the rules. And is that really what we're trying to do with them as students? I think sometimes we're a bit afraid of demystifying what it is that we're teaching them. So this misunderstanding about what information is, I think that, that a lot of us as teachers are afraid of. Um, another thing that Jude Carroll talks about a lot is we assess the product very often. So if I were to assess a student on their ability to play chess, I would just look at the finished board once somebody had won and say, yes, well done, you've won. But I'm not getting a sense of how they got there. So if things go wrong, I can't pinpoint as a subject teacher where they've gone wrong. I don't know that the reason the essay isn't very good is way back when in the process to do with their searching or to do with the way that they critiqued information. All I see is a bad piece of writing and I give them the feedback, this is a bad piece of writing. It's not the writing. So if we change the way, not only that we explain the rules, but that we assess and we look at how students are working, then we can help them much more to develop their skills right across the board rather than just giving them feedback on the finished product. So that's the context in which I'm looking at implementing the curriculum as a curriculum, as something that we make explicit and visible and we work with all the way through with our students. So for me, it's, it's very much changing what we mean by teaching as well as what we mean by information literacy. So teaching not as a transfer of information but as something else. The next thing that we thought about when we thought about, well, what's new about this is I looked at it as an educationalist and as a learning developer and I thought, well, I do a lot of this, I touch on a lot of it, not always in a very um, expert manner in some cases, but a lot of this I, I'd feel I, that I own in a sense, um, and yet it's come from a librarianship background. But it's so broad and so all-encompassing that, um, and rightly so I think, to holistically take into account the whole of that process of student learning, it doesn't belong to any one profession anymore. I think this is great. It may pose some barriers to us in implementing it, but it's become something where lots of different groups need to work together and share expertise about what they did. And if I've learned anything through working on this project, it's what nurse librarians do. And I hate to say it, but I had this very sort of old-fashioned idea that they stamp books and stuff and they, they catalog books. I don't know. But I think sharing that information has made me much more aware of how I, as a teacher or a learning developer, could productively work with librarians. So even if 
the only thing that comes out of implementing this is that sharing and of knowledge about what we could each offer the process. I think that would in itself be very positive. So some professions might um, see themselves as a core part of this. Obviously, librarianship might, although there will be areas where they feel less comfortable. Um, as a teacher, certainly, if I'm assessing a student, I'm assessing really all of this, directly or indirectly. I may not realize it, but I'm still assessing my student's ability, strand 10, to be somebody who can cope with the uncertainty of exploring a new information field and, and not have a crisis or a breakdown. I'm still assessing their sort of emotional um, resilience, I suppose, whether I realize it or not. So I still need to be aware of that dimension and factor it into my teaching. Um, there might be overlaps between different professions who are covering a lot of this. There will be gaps, obviously, where no one's covering it or everyone thinks that somebody else is, but in fact, it's fallen down a hole. Um, and it might be a major part of your role, but it might be a very minor part. It might also be a very incidental part. So um, as a subject teacher, you might well be involved, perhaps, in the more um, maybe counselling-y ends of things, where you're sort of mopping up students who have come to you quite distressed by the challenges that a lot of this has posed to them to their own identity as learners. So it'll take, I think, all of us outside our comfort zone a bit. And if we look at mapping this, which is the first thing that we did, mapping this onto who in the institution would offer this, it could be lots of us. Subject teachers, obviously, librarians, clearly, learning developers. Um, but it would also encompass people like counselling. It would encompass people like careers who are interested in employability. It would encompass people like the student union, peer mentoring, that kind of thing. Pretty much anyone who has anything to do with students, I think, would have some impact on this or would need to be aware of it or have impacts on their role. At Cambridge, we have the role of college nurse. And in the first instance, I thought, well, that, that doesn't really come into this. But actually, your college nurse is the person you go to at four in the morning when you're having a breakdown because you can't manage everything that's on your reading list. They are often the first front line. And their impact in this would be referral, to be aware of exactly who can do what to help the student through that particular learning challenge. So it's going to be slightly redefining our professional identities. Certainly, I've been challenged a little bit as a learning developer in terms of what's mine and what's theirs, and what actually is both of ours. And we're coming at it with very, very different perspectives. I'm teaching information literacy in a very sort of traditional sense. But my skills, because I'm not a trained librarian, weren't actually that great. So I'm going to need, I think, to look at developing my awareness of what librarianship is in a small way. And I think also if librarians are teaching this, they're going to be looking at perhaps a little bit of professional development around teaching and getting outside their comfort zones. Otherwise, what we've got, to get back to the cog metaphor, is a lot of gears turning, but nothing's actually happening. So unless this enmeshes in some meaningful way, it's not really going to happen as it should. And that's an incredibly difficult challenge. Not quite sure yet how I'm going to meet it. Um, Strand 3 is an example of the kind of area that I would feel is very much solidly in my domain and not so much perhaps in the librarian's domain, just to give you an example of where it might, uh, information literacy might be very unexpected. So this is what you do with information once you've got it, how you process it and how you incorporate it into your writing, how you then produce information yourself, which perhaps is not something that a librarian would necessarily feel part of their role, but to the student, the, the key thing to me about this curriculum is it's looking at the whole process of the eyes of the student rather than any one professional. So to me, that is, belongs very much within information literacy, you as somebody who is literate in producing it yourself and digesting it. From a top-down perspective, so an institutional audit tool, mapping out where in the institu institution um, this takes place, and that will vary, role titles will change, where that sits will change, but if someone in the, in the institution knows where this is happening, then each of those people can see where they sit within that bigger picture rather than each of us sitting in our own little silos not very aware of what goes on elsewhere. So then we can see where those productive join-up points might come. What you might also do is uh, it's an opportunity to share practice as well, so making each other's lives easier and sharing a little bit more information about what we do and what informs that. That's not going to work at Cambridge. Cambridge is both one institution and many, many institutions. So and a top-down approach is not going to work. So I'm looking at a bottom-up approach, something a bit more grassroots. Um, and I'm going to look at producing a teaching toolkit. Um, 
why teachers was a question that I've been asked a lot from librarians because this is obviously it came from the background of librarianship so why am I starting with teachers partly because I am one but from a student's point of view they are the first people that you encounter in a chronological sense teaching comes before librarianship just purely in a chronological sense not in a sense of status or anything like that but you, the, as a teacher you're the first people that students see um, you're also the people who shape the, the information need of that student. Without creating a need in the student for information, they're not going to go to the library because they don't need to. So you are the one who designs the context in which they will go out and start to develop these skills. Um, so that's why I wanted to start with teaching in that sense. Um, but I think what I want to do is I'm going to design um, some resources, some lesson plans, whatever it is, or ways of gently incorporating this into your teaching. But I want to run those by all the other professionals where possible that would have an impact on this. So that the, the teaching resources are shaped by the perspective using the expertise of other professions such as librarianship, disability resource centre, that sort of thing, counselling. Um, so that the teacher becomes a hub for that kind of join up. So one of the things I think it would be very helpful to do for teachers is to sort of benchmark where across the whole lifespan of a degree they think their students should be at any one point. That would be very useful for assessing course design. Um, some of the courses I look at, particularly in the sciences, have said, well, our students don't really need to do any of this until they hit the dissertation in the third year. So all of this curriculum in that case will need to be compressed into a very short space of time. Is that really the best way of doing it? Are there ways of kind of stretching it out slightly? Um, other more arts and humanities type degrees, that will naturally be spread across the whole course. But is it really articulated how the student is improving. So we teach them how to use a reading list in their first year. Are we, are we still designing reading lists? Are they still um, interpreting reading lists in the same way as a third year? I would hope not. So they need to revisit these skills as they move up, I think. So the induction model where we teach them and then the skills say the same throughout the whole degree course, I think we could revisit using this sort of mapping technique. What format it will take? Still undecided on this one. It needs to be um, very flexible to suit different contexts, obviously. But this kind of matrix I was looking at, a lot of the stuff that we offer is staff-led. So we decide where these courses should be run. We decide the format that they should be in. Often, speaking as a learning developer, it, I will be asked to run a course on writing or dissertation at a certain point. And it's outside the student's learning. It's seen as external, as, as Emma was saying. And the students don't really engage with it because it's not led by their perceived need. At the other end of things, working in a student services context, I was um, inundated with students asking for one-to-one -one support because that was the point they needed it. By that point, it's usually a crisis. And they're thinking in a very short-term way of just, I need to fix this essay and they'll be fine. Not thinking in a more developmental sense. So for me, ideally, either we would have a little bit of both, but they would join up so they would each cross-refer. Um, in Cambridge, we're lucky enough that we can have something that sits in the middle. We're lucky enough to have supervisions where we can offer one-to-one -one or very small group teaching. So you've got something which is led by the individual students in the class, but is also determined by the staff who, who know what the whole sort of syllabus is. But that's rather unusual. Looking at how subject expertise and professional expertise intersect is going to be an interesting one as well. As a subject lecturer in my former days before I qualified, I didn't really know an awful lot about teaching, but because I was a subject lecturer, I felt that my PhD qualified me to teach and to know everything about everything else because I had used libraries, I'd read books, therefore I could teach information literacy. My own skills were a little bit lacking. so. Um, it needs to be embedded in the subject, but I think the ability to draw on that professional expertise, it's often called generic expertise, and I agree it, it does need to be embedded in the subject, but that expertise could come from elsewhere, as I was saying, librarianship, counselling, disability support, careers, all the different professions that could helpfully inform what a lecturer is doing. So to get back to Jane's model, we're going to sort of invite a bit more discussion that perhaps I can learn from about how to embed this in institutions. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, I think we just want to open it up really now for questions. One of the um, things we were interested in, you know, we've got quite a few people here from LSE, was, you know, whether anyone had any thoughts of how we could implement this. But I think we're happy to take 
any questions from the floor and I think Sonia is monitoring Twitter if we have any questions <laughs> from Twitter. Already. You have one already? Yes. Oh. Do you want to take it to the forefront or should I? Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question as well just so that... Um, <coughs> Yeah, yeah, you go on. Yeah, yeah, go, go for it. One question is for Helen. How will the teaching toolkit be made relevant to different disciplines or will it take a generic approach? I think I'll be working more on the principles behind it, the kinds of um, opportunities that you will need to create for your students, but how you do that will differ according to different subjects. So in a science context where you have a textbook, that's very different from working with um, the kind of literature that an English literature student would. So I'll be thinking more about the kind of questions you need to raise with your students. Sorry, this is very vague and amorphous. It is at the moment, I'm afraid. But I think it would need to be the kind of st structures. I'm not looking at lesson plans necessarily, because I think they won't suit anybody, really. So what kind, of, what kind of learning opportunities do you need to create for your students, and how will you do that and adapt them to your discipline? Yeah, because I'm very aware that generic stuff is not really going to work terribly well. Okay. <clears throat> Have we got any any questions, reactions from the floor? Well, oh, um, I think yes, yeah, Susie. It was yeah. a very inspirational uh, discussion, and I, I I I do admire your enthusiasm for information literacy. And I think there should be a lot more of this uh, across the HE sector and not just in the individual institutions. And I, I've probably come away from this with a lot more questions, which is a good evidence that is, is quite inspiring. Uh, there are a number of, of issues that uh, are pertinent for me. Um, one of these issues, uh, one of the things you said, Jane, was, was it? Was it? Yes, it was you, I think. Um, talking about students who come to a chi and they get a shock of their lives mm. because they you know they were successful a level students they come to a chi and the culture is different yes yeah now, now i don't expect you to have yet an answer because i think this can the, the question i'm going to raise goes a bit beyond the project itself in fact it's it's questioning more of the culture of education as a whole, but it's a, it's an important issue that there are two different cultures between the school learning and the achievement. <coughs> and I question why that is the case. And I, I, I don't expect you to have an answer of the project to, to be mm. able to address this. Shouldn't the information literacy, independent learning, uh, ways of reflecting and being an active learner come from a school already and um, shouldn't this be, you know, so that when it comes to HE, we get to the point where we're starting from a different level rather than, you know, it's a rote learning versus independent learning. Yeah. And the two are two completely different worlds. Yeah. Uh, so in a sense, you're trying to fix something that should be fixed before the learners, the students come to achieve, don't you think? Yes. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to repeat what Susie said because I think probably people listening to the to the live streaming can't pick up your question. But it was you were just saying that the culture of school and the culture of HE shouldn't be as different, basically, yeah. as they are. And I, I would I would agree agree completely. Um, I, I think. I think it's quite worrying that independent learning doesn't seem to be um, encouraged at school level. We, we talked to one school librarian where they teach the International Baccalaureate and they did say that in that sort of syllabus it was independent learning what was encouraged a lot more. Um, but actually um, one of the, the points was, particularly in a school where they're trying to get students into the best universities, they actually are, almost have to just teach them what's on the, yeah. the syllabus to get the highest grades to, you know, 
to, to get the results. So it, it, is, it is wrong, but I think it's all very much linked to the way a lot of education has gone with league tables and things. John, did you want to say well, something? Like, may I follow up on that? Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. please, I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, the first thing is that, I mean, I, of course, what, what the previous speaker said is correct, um, but we are where we are, mm. and we can't make it about the school system. So if you're in higher education, you have to, you have to operate with that reality. Uh, the, thing that, uh, the thing that struck me was something, I think, that Helen said, um, where, where she said, about in relation to plagiarism, okay, that what, what, what you have to do is you basically have to say to students, this is now, you're now playing a different game, and here are the rules. Um, and, and that led to the thought about what a curriculum is, and in a way the curriculum is a kind of a definition mm. of, of what students ought to be, how you'd really like them to be, rather than anything else. Um, and then the chess analogy, which is interesting, and goes back to the plagiarism thing, which is that you're trying to teach people two things. One is the rules that they now have to play by. And the second thing is how to be good at it. Now, just take the chess example. There are two kinds of rules in chess. There are the constitutive rules. These are the rules which you have to follow in order to be said to be playing chess. Mm. And then there are the strategic rules, which are what govern how to become a better chess player. For example, always try and control the center of the board. Um, that's, that's a strategic rule in chess. Um, and in a sense, in, in this stuff, what, 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 what you're after, if you take the curriculum idea seriously, you, you're after students who, who know the constitutive rules of the, inf of, the, of the information literacy game, and also have picked up some of the, the, mm. the strategic stuff. Now, the problem with the strategic stuff is that it's almost like craft knowledge. That, that, so it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to teach craft knowledge. You can you can teach constitutive rules um, in in standard ways, mm. but the craft knowledge is harder. It is harder. Um, yeah. Mm. rather than trying to teach. Yeah. Yeah. So for each individual learner, what you're doing is not telling them this is how to be excellent in such and such, but it's about who are you, where are you coming from, where have you been already, and where do you want to take your journey in this subject? So it becomes an extremely individual emergence, mm -hmm. which becomes part of the learner's identity, which then perhaps shades into a researcher identity, an expert in a subject discipline. So yeah, it, it is much more about that is the kind of knowledge that has to be facilitated as opposed to imposed. But it's very Constitute. challenging, I think, for us as teachers as well, because firstly, we may have picked up this knowledge without really knowing what it is that we're doing. Therefore, we find it very hard to articulate to others. Um, and we kind of expect other people to pick it up as we did, forgetting that actually maybe it wasn't that easy at the time. But um, it's also this, this idea of this sort of the threshold concept that something brings about a shift in the way that you look at something so it's not something you have or don't have something comes about to create that shift and we can set up the conditions for doing that it is more difficult but it is possible and some students may never get there and that's I think where ability would come into it but it's also very challenging for us as teachers because we have to admit we don't have all the answers I didn't know that about the center of the board I shall bear that in mind it may make me a better <laughs> chess player but it may be that uh, what I need to do is to create a space for students to be able to explore and see what approaches work and don't work and, and draw their own rules and they might come up with different solutions to me in which case knowledge moves on a little bit so I have to let go of the idea that I as a teacher to have the knowledge and I'm there to give it to the students on a very functional sense yes but then again I think we're, we're creating conditions where we're both learning I've learned an awful lot from my students over the years mm. so I think it is possible I think we've got another question Uti, yeah uh, two points actually mm. to what, what you were to say one thing came to my mind is that it's not just the teacher teaching the students these um, generic skills and subject specific skills but one thing I did um, when a couple of years ago was teaching a first year course, and I had previously taught a second and third year courses, I got some of the second and third year students to come into the first year class and I was first giving them a sort of a, this is how you do political science kind of thing. So it wasn't just me telling them, that this is what you need to do to be good at this, but they were also getting this sort of far less, quite, quite amorphous rules or mm. hints or tips of how do you become a political science yeah. student. And I felt that worked really well. And those older students felt that that strengthened perhaps their identity. They didn't say those words, but I think it strengthened their identity because they felt that they were passing on some mm. tangible knowledge as such. So it was kind of a nice two-way street. But about um, LSE and you know in implementing uh, this curriculum in the LSE context, um, isn't the LSE 100 
a lot about, you know, if, if take, I'm looking at these strands. Yes, and yeah. Into their course. Yeah. So it's, it's that part of... Yeah, and we've certainly we have we've we've shared a lot of this with with LSE 100 as well, and I think it is it's something that we've, we're planning on taking forward to do some sort of audit as well to see if everything is is covered. I think one of the slight concerns I would have is that LSE 100 does only really cover the the well first first year and not going into the second year, and I would see this as something um, that you know, continues throughout your kind of academic career. And also, I think that, you know, it, there are going to be disciplinary differences. Mm -hmm. And to say, oh, LSE 100 are doing all that, they can only really hope to do that in quite a broad way. Um, it's also a very, very packed curriculum. So, you know, I think it's quite ambitious if you, if you could cover um, they, they certainly do have aspects of information skills um, in there, but um, at the moment, as far as I'm aware, they're not formally assessed. So the, although they're in there, they're, they're you know, they're, and, and similarly with communicating, presenting, those sort of skills are in there as well. But I think it, it, it's quite a challenge to do it in one course only. What's LSE 100? Um, LSE 100, <laughs> for <laughs> non-LSE people who are here and who are listening, is a, a core course that all our undergraduate students take. It's been running for two years, is it now? Yeah. Yeah, one pilot, and it's in, yeah. Yeah, it's in its, it, so it's in its first sort of year, and they, they all take um, the course that's all around sort of learning to think like a social scientist. Um, and it does have information skills within it. Yes, Sonia? Yeah, on that, uh, Katha is asking again, saying that she's interested in successful examples of where information literacy curriculum principles are being put into practice. So you've already mentioned LSE 100. Do you know of any others? Do we know of any other examples of where, where information practice. literacy curriculums are being put into practice? What kind of practices have been put into Well, we... <laughs> have you spoken to... <laughs> We, yeah, Emma, Emma and I are actually um, going to be um, publishing a book where we're trying to draw these all together. We've, um, we, yes, a small plug for our book um, that will come out next year and we are trying to get case studies um, to cover um, all the ten aspects of the curriculum. Um, in terms of, I mean, there are, there are a number of um, sort of good practice examples that we tried to draw together in our research. We found that quite time consuming to do that, didn't we? We have got in some of our final reports, though, some examples. There's a, there was a project um, that was from the University of Worcester that we looked at, the SMILE project, that looked at academic literacies and information literacy, and I saw a curriculum there. There are other examples of good practice that we've highlighted. I think some of them are on our website as well. Mm. But the less embedded they are, the, the more visible they are, really, yes. I think. Yes. It's very easy yes. to see the courses that are less embedded. So quite how you would look for information literacy provision that is just very, very subtly interwoven throughout a lecturer's teaching the whole way through, that would be harder to do. Yes. Yes, a couple of years ago we did also have a visitor who came from the University of Auckland and they've done quite a lot of successful work to do that, but it is totally integrated into mm. their curriculum. So as Helen says, it's, it's quite difficult to see. There's not a bit of it that you can kind of go, there's the, there's the information literacy bits all labelled. It's meant to be totally embedded. I think it's in mm. an engineering course. Um, so do, do we have any more questions? Yes, Dilianas? We're talking about, uh, let's say, a generic curriculum for information literacy, and the challenge is to find relevances to the individual disciplines. I wonder if we could look at it in a different way. For instance, can disciplines benefit from each other? So, to look at it from a different way is to bring all these disciplines together, their approaches to information literacy, to see how they can benefit from each other uh, be more innovative by looking at what other disciplines mm. are doing. Is this something that is probably relevant to this discussion? I I think I'm just going to repeat it just for people listening. But that was just about saying that rather than just focusing on one discipline to get disciplines to talk to each other to compare, you know, how their conceptions or perceptions of information literacy might differ. Um, I think that is something that 
we, we had a brief discussion, I remember, when we were doing the research about how it would be really interesting to get students from, say, history talking to students from, you know, economics, from medicine, about how they use information. I mean, it is something, I guess, would be an opportunity in LSE 100 as well, that you could, you could compare and contrast, because you'd have a broad range of students from disciplines. I think... I think it's quite interesting and useful, um, and it's probably more something I'd do at postgraduate level, if I'm honest. I think it, it would be quite challenging to, to know how to do that at undergraduate level, and I, I, I'm not sure how helpful it would be. It would mm. just be kind of broadly, you know, if you're studying medicine, do you really need to know how someone in English, mm. you know, uses their reading list? Yeah, I think you need to be comfortable in your discipline before you can then see how it relates to other disciplines. But yes, I think it, later on up that scale, it could be very interesting. Mm. It's probably yeah. worth saying as well about strands four and five are deliberately subject specific. So there are strands that are generic, but then there are the strands where we haven't mm. been able to fill in all of the gaps because that will be done between faculty, library, learning developers to design things that are deliberately set within the context of the discipline to give students a foundation in that exactly that kind of thinking and reflection of how does my approach work within the demands of the discipline as well as academia as a whole. Mm. So it's, it's partly generic, but it's partly designed to be right there in the subject as well. OK. Yeah. No more questions? I think, yes, I think uh, we're probably moving towards winding up now. Yeah. So Steve, do you want no more? Thank you. I was just saying we are now moving towards winding up now, so if there are no more questions from the floor, or indeed online, I'd like you all to join with me in thanking our three speakers for a fascinating and stimulating session.